Hi, my name is Tom Sherlock. I work at Wolfram Research in the User Interfaces Department. Um, my talk is Multispectral Astronomical Imaging. My name is Tom Sherlock. I'm, um, <clears throat> I work at Wolfram Research uh, in the User Interface uh, Group. I work on the front end. So <clears throat> if you um, if you have any problems with things like uh, auto completions or spell checking or templates or the SCU interface or hyperlinks, it's probably my fault. So just <laughs> you can uh, come find me uh, after the talk if, if I'm actually available. I will be disappearing rather quickly. Uh, but today I'm gonna to talk about um, <clears throat> how you can use uh, Mathematica for interoperability. And uh, once again, I'm going to talk about my hobby, which is uh, astronomy and astrophotography. And I try to do uh, most of the work with, uh, with Mathematica. And uh, so today I'm going to be talking about automating a, uh, an astronomical observation uh, using Mathematica and, uh, and a package that I've written, which is also available for download. So let's get started. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to talk about um, doing traditional um, astrophotography with a monochrome CCD camera. And I'm going to show the process that is used to um, collect the data for that and how you can automate that using the Wolfram language. And um, so let's uh, see what we're getting into here. <clears throat> a lot of people think, you know, when you do astrophotography, you just take a picture of the sky and, and you have something there, but it's not quite that simple. And uh, uh, most quality astrophotography is done using uh, what's called a monochrome camera, which is only takes a black and white image. So you say, what is it? You know, you see all these great pictures coming from the James Webb Space Telescope or the Hubble Space Telescope. They're all in beautiful colors. Well, I got news for you. Those were all taken with black and white cameras. They're taken through a series of filters. And so there's advantages and disadvantages of that. We're going to go through some of the advantages and some of the disadvantages and how the Wolfram language can be used to, uh, to speed things along and make things easier. Advantages of monochrome cameras is they're, they're more sensitive. So all the pixels in the camera participate in the image. Um, so what I'm talking about here is you say, well, you know, the camera in my iPhone is a color camera. Well, no, it's a monochrome camera. Uh, but what you don't realize is that in front of the CCD sensor um, in your uh, iPhone, there's an array of filters uh, and there can be usually red, green, and blue filters, or they can be, uh, uh, cyan, magenta, yellow filters, but they're arrayed in like a checkerboard pattern. And the color picture that you get uh, is the process is derived mathematically from the uh, signals coming from different uh, chunks of that grid. Uh, and it's interpolated through a process called demosaicing. Um, and you can get astronomical cameras that do that, but the better quality cameras, the better uh, results are obtained with using a monochrome camera and putting separate filters across the sensor. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So you get greater sensitivity, color isn't always needed. Sometimes you don't need or want color in your image, like to do photometry. I gave a lecture about this a couple of years ago and you're really just interested in pixel uh, electron counts then. So color isn't really necessary and you can do that with a monochrome camera. Um, you can also extract scientific data. And this is the real reason why cameras like this are used on all space probes. Um, I think uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, latest uh, rover that was sent to Mars, uh, it was the first one that actually had actual color cameras on it, but the scientific cameras are still monochrome cameras. Um, so you can use uh, uh, this to get scientific data through like, for instance, narrow band filters to observe specific spectral lines. And uh, another thing you can do is you can split up an observation to collect different color data. It doesn't all have to be done on the same night or at the same time. It can be done across a series of weeks or months and you can just assemble everything when you're done. 
So for these reasons, monochrome cameras are always used to collect scientific data. Disadvantages, it uh, takes more work to obtain a color image if you need it. But luckily, you can automate most of this stuff using the Wolfram language or other software. But we're going to use Wolfram language. So to get a color image like this, this is a picture of M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. Uh, you need at least three images, one through a red filter, a green filter, and a blue filter. Typically, it's done, you do it with four images. You take three color images and then a black and white, what's called a luminance image through a, just a clear filter, and you combine all four of them. And the luminance image will enhance the uh, spatial uh, data in the image. And the color uh, data will just do the color image. It's, it's grayscale. I'm, I'm just using these terms loosely, black and white. Uh, it's, it's a, by monochrome, I mean a grayscale camera. Okay. So uh, unfortunately, in order to minimize the noise with um, astronomical image, uh, imaging, uh, you need to take uh, more than one image uh, and you combine them to average out the noise. So for each one of the filters, you're gonna be taking a sequence of images. And since you're taking it through possibly four filters, uh, you're gonna be taking that sequence four times. And you can also use narrow band filters. Uh, this is, um, these are uh, specific filters that isolate uh, different parts of the spectrum. For instance, uh, sulfur two transition, the hydrogen alpha lines or oxygen three uh, lines. Um, and you can use this to determine the distribution of different elements in a, an object that you're looking at. A lot of uh, nebula uh, glow strongly in oxygen three light. And you can see that uh, by assigning a color to uh, the light coming from the oxygen three filter. And uh, there's actually something called the Hubble palette, which is kind of a standard palette used by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this assigns uh, the sulfur two line to red hydrogen alpha to green and oxygen three uh, to blue. Uh, and which is a bit of a fib because those uh, lines are nowhere near those actual colors. For instance, hydrogen alpha is bright red, uh, sulfur two is a deep red and oxygen three is uh, a bright green, but here we're calling it blue. But you can do that to create a false color image. And the purpose of that image is not necessarily to show what the thing would look like out in space, but to show you where the elements are distributed in that image. So that's why uh, this type of imaging is done for scientific work. So, um, <clears throat> so as I said before, uh, we have to, and I've said this before, and I've done all sorts of lectures on this, so I'm just gonna gloss over this. Um, <clears throat> this is um, part of the problem. Another part of the problem, especially with astronomical imaging where you're taking pictures of extremely dim objects, you have to ma maximize the signal to noise ratio. So the way we do this uh, is we take a lot of images, we align them and average them out and they'll average out the noise and enhance the signal. So uh, there's different types of noise. There's thermal noise, there's readout noise, and then there's uh, like geometric noise and we take a series of what are called calibration frames to eliminate each one of these effects. Um, and when you're doing multispectral imaging, it has the additional complication uh, uh, that you have to take the flat frames um, which for each filter, because each filter probably has different particles of dust on it and they produce donuts in the image. So you really have to uh, calibrate each one of those filters. So, but we can do this uh, easily using the Wolfram language. So the way I did this is uh, using uh, the standard ASCOM interface. And this is an API uh, described in ascomstandards.org, which is used to um, access all sorts of astronomical instruments. For instance, cameras, focusers, filter wheels, domes, the telescope mount, uh, uh, rotators, a bunch of different things. Ch chances are they have an ASCOM uh, set of drivers written for them. And almost if not all the ASCOM API I've wrapped in a package, which I call um, 
uh, astrodevice.m, which is part of the downloads for this uh, lecture. And, and that'll let you use the Wolfram language to talk to the ASCOM API. And this is a, a little chunk of astrodevice.m. So for instance, here, you can see that I'm getting the, uh, <clears throat> the camera's uh, binning factor, uh, whether the camera's connected. So these are some get and set methods. So given the camera, it'll tell you what the binning is, whether it's connected, whether the thermoelectric cooler is on, uh, whether it's capable of fast readout, and you can set the stuff too. So this is just a little chunk of a large file. Um, there's a problem with uh, Astro device, maybe a problem, maybe not a problem, is uh, right now this package uses NetLink, which is a Windows only uh, API. So that's uh, a limitation if you're uh, working on Mac or Linux. However, there's good news. Uh, as, um, the ASCOM standards have, are building a new API called the Alpaca API, which is a RESTful API. It only requires the ability to have TCP on your system. So it's supported on all platforms. And, and luckily the namespace for the Alpaca API is virtually identical to the classic ASCOM API. So in the next month or two, I will roll out uh, a new version of Ast uh, Astro device, which will talk to the Alpaca API. But for the impatient, uh, I should note that uh, the uh, NetLink uh, uh, interoperability layer in Mathematica can also be initialized using the regular MathLink. So you can basically get most of the advantages of Alpaca right now today by just using a math link, and then you can have two different computers, which don't have to be in the same room. They can be in different parts of the world uh, talking to each other. You can uh, do all this stuff on your Macintosh and have a Windows machine connected to your, uh, to your telescope and your camera. But that will be, whether you want to uh, try that, I've demonstrated that kind of in principle in my home, but uh, uh, the full uh, application will be done uh, by, by you. So this is the camera I use. Uh, this is a very low-end uh, monochrome uh, imaging camera. And the device on the front of it is the filter wheel, which contains five filters. There's red, green, blue, clear for luminance, and uh, an opaque one, which is a substitute uh, shutter uh, for this cheap camera, which doesn't actually have a shutter built into it. Uh, if I didn't have that, I had to put a hat over the end of the telescope. So it's a, it's a step up from the hat method, but uh, it's, not, uh, it's not perfect. So let's see how we actually do this. Um, you do um, load in the Astro device package. You initialize the interface. It's init device interface 32 because ASCOM is currently 32 bits. Um, you set up a data uh, collection area. So the number of frames that you wanna collect of each type and the exposure. And then you have to get uh, a camera device and for this uh, example, we're just using camera and filters. So we're, we just need to get the camera device and the filter wheel device. And if you call these functions, uh, select device camera or select device filter, uh, ASCOM will throw up a dialogue box saying, asking you to select which camera because you may have several cameras on your uh, computer or several filter wheels. And one of the properties I set for the filter wheels, I gave actual names to the different filters and the different uh, uh, positions on the, uh, the carousel. So I called them uh, luminance, red, green, blue, and dark frame. So then if you call get filter wheel names, it will give you these uh, easy to remember names. And then we can start playing around with the camera. Uh, we can get what temperature the camera is at. So that'll tell you what temperature uh, the camera is currently at. Then you can turn on the little refrigerator, which is connected to the CCD chip, the thermoelectric cooler. And then you can set the, uh, uh, the camera to be 20 degrees below ambient. So set camera sensor temperature, and that will uh, start cooling the camera down. And this is uh, important uh, for another reason, because um, since uh, things like dark frames are dependent on the temperature, if you can always set the camera at a given temperature, uh, then you can build up a dark frame library at a given temperature, and then you can just use that. You don't have to recollect uh, dark and bias uh, data. So, 
So then we can, and by the way, you don't have to do the calibration frames first. You can do this some other time. And if you have the library, you're, you're good to go. But this is how you would collect, uh, for instance, a set of uh, bias frames. Bias frames uh, are, they just measure the noise that are, that's associated with reading out uh, data from the CCD chip. So it really needs a very, very short exposure. So this ask dark frame just, uh, <clears throat> So Mathematica doesn't throw up a dialog box saying put a hat on the telescope. <clears throat> and then uh, since I've got a shutter on the camera, so I set up a directory for the bias frames. I set my filter wheel position to uh, dark frames. So that closes it off. I want to take high resolution images. So I'm setting the camera binning to one. So that's all pixels are individual pixels. And then I call this function, acquire fits image sequence. So what this will do is this will take a sequence of images, uh, frame count images, uh, and store them in a sequence of FITS files in my bias directory. And each one will have the word bias prepended to it so I know which ones they are. And uh, the false uh, is just, um, you can also have this open and close the shutter on the camera, but since my camera doesn't have a shutter, uh, it doesn't matter. And also this particular thing, get camera exposure min, uh, for the camera that uh, calls the ASCOM API to ask the camera, what is the shortest exposure? Because that's what we need in order to um, get uh, just bias data. So that's, <clears throat> that's what that is. And then this will just uh, process through it and, and take a sequence of things and you wind up with a series of FITS files in your directory. Same thing for dark frames, since the dark frames are just basically the same as bias frames, except they're at the actual temperature and length of exposure uh, that uh, <clears throat> you're gonna be using. It's the same exact thing, except that I store them in a different directory. I still have it set to dark frame, still dark, still uh, setting the camera binning and it acquires another fits image sequence. Uh, now for flat frames, it's a little trickier uh, because um, <clears throat> you have to, uh, a flat frame is a, an image of an evenly illuminated object. And traditionally, uh, the evenly illuminated object is like the twilight sky uh, or the pre-dawn sky if you've been up all night. Uh, or uh, you can also aim the telescope at an evenly illuminated surface, for instance, like that monitor there, uh, which is in my basement office. Um, so uh, that's these are all good ways to get flat frames. And, but it's a little bit trickier than that uh, because you want to get a good exposure for the flat frames. And the way you can do this is you want to get something that's not saturated. And it's easy to saturate the camera when you're pointing at something like that monitor or the, the, the evening sky. So you need to play around with the exposure. And obviously the exposure is going to be different for whatever camera you have until you get a histogram. And Mathematica makes really nice histograms. Uh, so that will be a, a histogram of a single frame brought off the camera of, you know, for a 0.1 second exposure. So that's what you want. You want something kind of in the middle like that. So you use that. And if you, if you think about it for a second, you should really do a separate exposure for each one of the filters because they're going to have a little different response. So I'm glossing over that, but that's, that's kind of what you need to do. Uh, so if we take five flats at 0.1 seconds, you set up your directory for the flat frame and then you collect flats for each filter. And this, this sort of thing really beats, uh, you know, screwing filters on for each one and resetting the camera and all sorts of nightmarish stuff that you don't want to do in pitch darkness when you're uh, dealing with cold and stuff. So this will just uh, munch through all the, uh, the different filters in the filter wheel and it will uh, take a sequence of flat frames which will record positions of the, all the dust motes on your filters and uh, store them in the directories we set up. So that will get you your flats. 
And then uh, we get around to acquiring the actual um, image uh, frames. So this is, um, uh, this is where we actually take a picture of something in the sky. So the rest was just kind of the preliminaries. So uh, for this, uh, <clears throat> we do basically the same thing. We create a directory and for the lights, and then we just call acquire LRGB sequence. And that will munch through each one of the filters in your filter wheel and take frame count uh, exposures for each one of them at frame exposure, and it will store them in that directory. And so you may have 20 exposures on each one of them, but you don't have to do anything because it's all automated by that function. And the source for that function is in the Astro device package. So it'll acquire red, green, blue, and luminance frames. And you can go inside, you can make hot chocolate, you can uh, uh, watch something on Netflix and just let the camera munch away. And hopefully uh, your alignment is good enough so things don't start swimming around and uh, all your work will be done for you. And then when you're done, you just disconnect the devices. So at that point, uh, you just need to do the processing. Now, I talked about the processing uh, procedures uh, last year at the talk. So I'm just gonna kind of uh, gloss over them a little bit. And I've also uh, covered them in a, uh, a community talk, which is listed up there. And that goes into more detail about how to create the, uh, the final image. But I'm just gonna go over it uh, briefly here. So for <clears throat> the bias frames, uh, you average them to create a master bias frame. Uh, same for the dark frames. You uh, average them to create a master dark frame. And then uh, <clears throat> the light frames are aligned and averaged to create master red, green, blue, and luminance frames. And those are with the technique used in this uh, community post and also from last year, the actual uh, details of the alignment algorithm uh, are actually in Python. So this shows you another uh, strength of Mathematica that you can use it to call out to different languages. As it turns out, there's some very good routines for uh, aligning uh, uh, star fields written in Python. And we don't have to uh, translate that into the Wolfram language. We just call those routines. And so, uh, and you can actually put the Python code right into your notebook. And that's all detailed in that posting. So that's how uh, light frames are aligned and averaged to create the master uh, uh, color channels. And then um, you take, you subtract out the bias, the dark uh, frame uh, noise, and um, that will create calibrated frames. And then uh, you process your flat frames, which is just averaging for each one of the channels. Um, and then the channel images are processed using another uh, Wolfram language uh, feature, brightness equalize, which will <coughs> spread brightness and subtract out things like uh, dust motes. And that will take a flat frame and the frame you want to uh, equalize and it will produce a final frame. And then the four channels uh, can be combined using this code, which is also detailed in that posting. So this is uh, um, color combined LRGB, not, uh, it's not just three channels, you're combining four channels. And I'll just describe briefly what this is doing. Um, <clears throat> so it does some checking. The first channel is assumed in the list that's passed into this is assumed to be the luminance one. So it gets the dimensions of the luminance channel. And then it, if it needed, it resizes the color uh, data to fit the luminance data. And then it uh, aligns it using image align. I don't need to use the Python uh, routine for this because at this point, the images are pretty bright because they've been stacked up and uh, our normal image align works pretty good for that. And then I combine just the color channels to get an RGB channel an RGB image, and then I convert that to an LAB image, which is uh, an image uh, that has three channels, uh, two color channels represented by A and B, <clears throat> a luminance image. 
and then I take out the luminance and I plug in the luminance that came uh, from our direct observation, and then I recombine it in the LAB color space, and that will produce the final uh, LRGB image. So, and there it is. So that's uh, the ring nebula produced uh, in this manner. So, so that's it. Any questions? Yes, actually, uh, uh, you can use smoke glass. Uh, uh, the uh, traditional thing is to use a white T-shirt, which I keep in my my imaging collection. Use a clean white T-shirt. You put it over the front of. Well, yeah, it has to be focused at infinity. Otherwise, you're going to get uh, uh, artifacts of the the telescope in. On the flat frame, which you, which you don't, which I've done before, but you, you don't want it. Like if you have a Schmidt Cassegrain scope, you're going to see kind of a donut shaped thing, which is because of the there's a, an obstructed uh, uh, optical path. So yeah, you, same focus. Uh, put a T-shirt, which helps distribute it more evenly, and and that works great. So yes, sir. So I have an idea of using a uh, James Webb telescope. Mm -hmm. You can absolutely do that. There's a website set up, and I've been on this website, and the data is humongous, as you might guess, but you can download every single image uh, taken by the James Webb Space Telescope, and not just the final pretty color images. You can uh, download these subframes and process it using exactly this technique, and you'll, you can create your own images. And a lot of amateurs have done that. They've seen if they can improve on the James Webb or the NASA uh, processing. So yes, I encourage you to do that. The the images obviously are very high resolution, but uh, it's a good rewarding thing to get into astrophotography using the best telescope we have available. Is that better? What do you search for to get to that site? Oh boy, I'll have to send that to you. I've got it on uh, my other computer, uh, but uh, yeah, it's it, and it's a little bit uh, uh, tricky to find uh, what you want because the stuff it, there's a lot of stuff in there. And, but all the observations are, are all listed in there and, and all the data is in there. So, and they're all FITS files, which this works with. Yes, sir. Probably will work that way too. Yeah, I, I haven't tried that, but it's probably yes. Probably yes. I, I, I've forgotten about that. Um, Sir, uh, let's see how we're doing here on time. Yes, I, 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 I was going. To, I was trying to do that yesterday, and then I thought, I'll just ask Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just ask Jeff. He, he'll he'll help me do it. Uh, so so the second best thing I just included it with the talk, but there's there's other uh, stuff. In the in our little uh, collection, which Jeff has contributed to, it's not just me. Uh, that um, uh, we we should put the whole the whole thing in the package repository, so anyone can use. And it's not just this sort of stuff. It's like image processing stuff and and alignment stuff and photometry stuff. So it's all it's all good stuff, and we're going to publish it all. But for right now, you got the stuff that talks to ASCOM. Uh, well, I mean, images are images, and uh, if your telescope is is locked on to an object, it will stay there pretty good. I mean, oh uh, yes, that that's also a possibility. But remember, uh, the main thing that would drift would be the temperature of the camera, and since the camera is uh, is a closed loop type of thing it's being refrigerated at a specific temperature. That's why you can build a, a library of like dark frames. So that's, so if you're in the, in you're shopping for an astronomical camera, make sure you get something that you can, it's regulated, you can set to a certain temperature. Most of them are nowadays, but that's, okay. So I think, good. okay, good.